It's the How to Write Funny podcast. This is Scott Tickers. My guest today is Dave Eggers. He's one of the most celebrated writers of his generation, and he's also a pioneer in American humor. A noted do-gooder, his thoroughly awesome 826 National tutors disadvantaged kids and gets them writing. Dave, you for, for many years, you've been a very enigmatic person for, for me and I think for a lot of people. People know your name and they know a lot of your work, but they may not know a lot about how, how you got there, how you did it. So much of that, like you've sort of eschewed publicity a lot of the time, and maybe you have an uncomfortable relationship with fame such as it is nowadays. So just kind of give us a, a, the basic bullet points of like, how you got to where you are, and then maybe we can go through and talk about some of those particular points of interest. Oh, boy. Um, Professionally, I mean. Um, I think since, you, since we're talking about comedy, and we're both from... You're from the Midwest, or... You, okay, yeah, you went to college at Madison, right? I guess I dropped out, but oh, I, you dro- I, yeah. I grew up in the Midwest, and yeah. you you lived in sh- the Chicago area. Yeah, and, and I went to Illinois. Yeah, Champaign Urbana, um, right? Ostensible rival of Wisconsin, although I don't think the schools cared about each other one way no, or the other. They don't care. But when you guys were doing the Onion, I think we were doing Might Magazine here in San Francisco, and they were. I think getting at some of the same things and both deeply influenced by Letterman and Spy and Monty Python and whatever else. And I think that we were reading the same stuff growing up and watching the same stuff growing up. And um, and so we, although, you know, Might Magazine way back when was um, very idealistic at first. It was supposed to be a magazine that was you know trying to rile up a generation to do good things in the world and and uh upend the dominant paradigm and you know whatever else we were we were deeply influenced by our first few years in san francisco and that sort of city lights radical idealism and uh And, um, but then, you know, when after a few issues, we did not change the world, we turned to comedy and, and most of the rest of the, the run of might was mostly, or at least half of it, every issue was, was, uh, satire. Now, how long did it go, might? I think three and a half years. Okay. And then we just sort of, uh, we never made a dime and nobody was ever paid. It was always, uh, a part-time job for everybody. And at a certain point, nobody could hack that anymore. So, and 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 the magazine had done well enough that we, you know, a lot of people got offered real jobs, and um, there were only five of us back then. But well, let me uh, interject there briefly. When I first saw Might, it was when it was still being published, and The Onion was very young, and I remember just being incredibly jealous of Might mm. because it was color it was glossy <laughs> yeah. uh, that's where cover. the money for salaries went you know? yeah no we decided not to do that at the onion because we couldn't afford it so yeah. we, we had to print on newsprint which made us so a much smarter comedy newspaper but we wanted to be uh, a, a, a magazine yeah and you got to be and also it was my impression that you had some kind of national distribution which shocked me because that just seemed like such an impossible nut to crack at that early stage i don't know how well we cracked it i think we ended up distributing maybe 10, 5, 10,000 copies of every issue and selling some, you know, uh, sad percentage of them. But it got to some of the people we wanted it to get to, and the readership was pretty devoted, and we had fun doing it. I mean, that was my first exposure to just the incredible, uh, like, ridiculous fun of group writing, comedy writing. And we group you know, the five of us and maybe six, seven here and there group wrote a lot of things. And, um, and we would add, you know, touches the same way it would be, I guess, in any sort of writer's room. And so after that, there were a couple of us that sort of, you know, there was a guy, Zev Burrow and I were in New York at one point and Rodney Rothman, who was then the head writer, 
who was of Letterman. Yeah, was younger than us. I think. Right, I right. think he was so young. But you know, we talked about maybe writing for Letterman, and um, it was one of these things where growing up idolizing Letterman. I mean, we had VHS tapes with every last bet, bet. You know, uh, all of our favorite moments. We were Chris Elliott, the Chris uh, Elliott stuff, the Jay <laughs> Leno had, stuff. We right? had a two-hour <laughs> VHS tape of every. Chris Elliott, uh, Man Under the Seats, and uh, The Fugitive Guy, and Moomin and we had we had everything, uh, and we would watch. The, you know, we had everything memorized. So there we were, Zev and I, who you know we were offered uh, a gig writing as a duo for Letterman, and but you know, living in New York, working 18 hours a day. I think at that point, the contracts were like five weeks guaranteed. And after that, it was up for grabs again. So it was just like, maybe not the right time or something, but we, I still can't believe we didn't do it. Um, But instead, another might writer, Chris Harris, we introduced him to uh, Rodney and to Kate Adler, who was one of the producers. And and he got a job, and he was there for years and years, and uh, went on to write a lot of shows, How I Met Your Mother, and some other stuff. And uh, so, um, but anyway, it was a it was a fun time. And uh, you know, the the next time I had that experience was at I went to work at Esquire for about eight months, and I did the Dubious Achievements, which was another thing that was huge to me growing up. Yeah, I mean, that was the from what I understand the inspiration for Spy Magazine. Oh yeah, you're right. I think so. And that spy must have been a huge influence on you at that time. It was, and you know, the early spy. The, you know, the, right. uh, the especially golden year, the, the funny years, as they call it. Yeah, and um, I can't say I, I had every issue. I mean, I think it was like I probably only got a hold of four or five issues. Really? Um, oh my god, I remember those being released, and it was just like manna from heaven every yeah. time every time a new issue would drop it was like oh my god just had to devour every word of it you know we um we read it at might and uh, at that point it was in its i think second or third iteration i think in the early 90s. had it already been sold do you think at that yeah point? i think so i mean this yeah, is I think when that my like, senility kicks in but yeah late 80s early 90s so you've been right on the cusp but there was something to, in the early days of spy that Half of it I, we couldn't understand from Chicago. Like it was so New York, so much Pretty of high it. society. I didn't stuff. know who the people were that right. they were talking about, and so there were always pieces that were that I loved, and then other pieces that I'd say half of every issue I just went completely over my head. But but I remember I have a vivid memory of reading Spy. <laughs> this is so terrible, but driving from Chicago to Champaign, it's a straight shot. So it doesn't, the road doesn't turn for two and a half hours pretty much. So I, you could read by <laughs> your drove. And so I used to have spy on the steering wheel. And I remember, I can't remember what this article was, but it was some list. It was like 1,200 things, uh, maybe the worst things done by George Bush. I forget what it was at that moment. But, but I have a very vivid memory of reading spy while driving for two and a half hours, laughing my ass off. And, um, and then much later, you know, uh, we got to interact a little bit with uh, with Kurt Anderson and and uh, Graydon Carter. And um, now, how did that come about? Was that because of your association with Esquire or something else? Maybe, you know, what it was with Dubious Achievements. I was able to bring some people in. I, I got to uh, we. I sort of built the little writers' room for that, and it was like Paul Tuff, who's a literary writer for Harper's and. Uh, you know, education writer now. I sort of knew him, this guy, Steve Sherrill. We knew these guys a little bit through Might. And Larry Doyle, who was an Illinois grad and who was a friend of a friend. And um, he came in, he wrote for The Simpsons uh, right before that, I think. And then we sort of recreated that, sort of the fun that we had at Might. But these guys were on a whole nother level. Like they were, I just remember sitting, and I don't think I did anything outside of organizing it. Cause I just, I was laughing to the point where my, I get a thing where in the back of my head, it kind of feels like my brain's going to like pop out of the back and crying and laughing so hard eight hours a day. And it felt like, why would anyone do anything but this? Just assemble people that make you laugh that hard and then try to make, you know, put a, put an issue together. But, um, but that was the one I edited 
and then I sort of uh, left. Uh, McSweeney's was born out of that period because I was putting mix the first issue together from my desk at Esquire and using their fax machine and, and computers and things like that. Um, but anyway, so at, at McSweeney's, we tried to do the meeting all those guys like Steve Sherrill and, and Larry and a lot of these guys had literary humor pieces that they, it was hard to place them then because shouts and murmurs had shrunk a little bit and there weren't that many, uh, venues for what used to be a casual like Ian Frazier or Woody Allen kind of casuals in the New Yorker. So that was the McSweeney's website and, and the first issue was to try to find a home for a lot of that longer form so-called literary humor. And this was really early in the internet, right? Like that was, this was 98. 98. So, okay. so there's not a lot going on. Yeah. The that's why the McSweeney's website looked like it did because most web design then was and is incredibly ugly and very ever-changing and it's just not a great medium for design i think it's a tough medium because it changes every other minute so you know a friend and i elizabeth carries we built that original site to be you know what no matter what happens with the web no matter where it goes this design will be classic and it'll just be the text did you actually learn html or was she no never i think she did it and then we had some other help we were both print designers but she was an art director at salon so i knew her from i worked her for a few years part-time at salon so that was another thing i wanted to talk to you about is the design aesthetic that mcsweeney's has um has always had a lot of the books have and even the, the A26 stores and stuff. You just mentioned in passing that you were a designer. So when did that come about? And I'm assuming this is kind of your look and you oversee a lot of the design, which is why it all looks like it belongs together. Yeah, I, so I was an art major at, I was a painting major at Illinois. That's okay. what I studied most of my time at Illinois. I see. I changed my major a lot of times, but my, most of my time was painting. And then I finished up in journalism, but... Um, I always, I grew up thinking I'd be a painter. That was all my training growing up and big money in that big money in it. And, um, but to make a living, I was a designer. So for six years here in San Francisco, I was a temp. I went around, I worked at the phone company. I worked at the, uh, uh, worked at a phone book company. I would zip around the city in the Bay Area and go wherever they were paying hourly wages for people that knew how to use a Macintosh. Wow. We were called Mac Temps. This is the late 80s? No, no, this is 92 to 98, 90s, okay. Okay. 92 to 97. Um, back then, if you knew how to use a Mac, which was the most rare skill, it was considered very fringe so that they, we had our own temp agency. Uh, or I worked for th- this temp agency, we could make $18 an hour back in 93, which is a lot. So I did that for years and years. And then we had our own little design agency. That So Mike was also a design agency. We were out of the oh. same office. That's how we paid the bills. Yeah, I know. Great side business to actually make money, right? To keep the magazine. Oh, afloat. yeah. We never made a dime on Mike, but we would do ads for people and design stuff and we were hacks but we were quick and cheap and um that paid the bills but eventually working learning on the job i sort of started refining a little bit and when mcsweeney's came out i had refined at least all my the nonsense part of design down to a few principles and tried to like work within constraints and say well what if we only use one font and constraints are so helpful so and is that Garamond? That font is Garamond three. Which it's is three. A little. <laughs> I was going to say ver- it's a little tighter, <laughs> smaller. I think thinner. more. It's not necessarily thinner, but it's, aren't the um, serifs or the? Um, I don't know what you call. I'm not a font person, but the line right before the serif gets so hairline thin. Not with Garamond three. Okay. Garamond three is really durable, so it's and you can shrink it down to three point. You, know, you can still read it, which is different than some fonts. So we use one font. <laughs> And, and it was all black and white, which is very different than the glossy color magazine world I'd been in for sure. a while. And it was a reaction to all that and say, well, what if you reduced and distilled and worked within very rigid constraints? And, I, and it ended up looking a lot better than anything I'd done before. And uh, so that became kind of the house style of McSweeney's. And 
I always thought that, you know, I think that fonts have an IQ. I feel like books have to look a certain way to, to give them dignity. That's why we applied dignified design principles to literary humor instead of like the wacky way that humor is very often designed and yeah, you think, don't do the red parody banner yeah you know <laughs> i feel like uh you know the 80s were a terrible time i think for a lot of comedy books or humor books because it was always the writer on the cover with a you know with a funny hat on or yeah, it whatever was Dave it was Barry or a stand-up comic who had a tv show yeah and you know and i was a big dave Barry fan growing up and he's uh i got to meet him he's you know he's a a great guy and um but you know it's a different aesthetic yep. and i sort of wanted to bring it back to like the woody allen without feathers like just the text um give it a little bit of and and david sedaris's books were very that it was a shift toward the literary and i thought well that's the way to do it is to get out of the way of the text let the jokes be the jokes in the text and don't you don't have to put a, a clown nose on every page so uh so that's what we were trying to do, and um, it looks very—if you don't mind my saying—looks very similar to Spy magazine. Well, Spy was a beautifully designed magazine, so that influenced me a lot in terms yeah. of what they did with type. The type, this, yeah, is the main area. It was very new. You got then. rid of the cutout heads, but you yeah. used their type. That that very well might have been the main typographical influence when I was a young designer, because I thought the type was so beautiful, and. Um, but you know, I think it. I think it matters, and we we bring that aesthetic to everything at McSweeney's, and also eight two six Valencia is all the books that we produce by with student authors are all really well made. We have full time designers who are very very good to kind of bring dignity to that too, and to say, well, even though it's student writing, it doesn't have to have like a student packaging that makes it look like, you know. Oh, don't worry, it's just students, you know. But if you give it sort of like a very, you know, the, the uh, again, I keep I always use the word dignity, but if you give it a dignified package, then people say, well, this author might be 16, 17, but they're, they belong in the same context, the same kind of professional atmosphere as anybody else, which I think is the truth. That's great. I use the word, I, my go-to word for that is gravitas. That's yeah. what I always use. And it's, di it's so interesting how... I see the difference between like McSweeney's and your trajectory from The Onions, because for us, gravitas could mean like a very serious news anchor, like a Ted Knight or a Ron Burgundy or whatever. So it's it's not dignified. It's yeah. actually, but it has that gravitas. But the design matters. So I was looking at The Onion closely because the paper, it has to look, so new, using actual newsprint was key. So right. to the average person, it has to look like USA Today in 1987. When you pass by, you're like, well, that's just, just newspaper. It's printed on the same newsprint. So that verisimilitude is key. And if you lose it, you know, when you're doing parody, if you lose the actual materiality of it, then you lose the whole joke. So The Onion was always done perfectly in my... Uh, and now the uh, click hole I saw yesterday, which has... The, it's indistinguishable from all the sites that it parodies, which yeah, is perfect. They do a great job. With I don't know where the, where the line stops. I don't know if any of the ads in there are real ads. It's so great. It's just this <laughs> hall of mirrors that I think is brilliant. But, you know, you do have to have that. The texture of it has to be the same. Um, the design has to look right. And that's why, I mean, I always read The Onion on, in paper. And when it... And I remember, because there was an onion box at uh, 20th and Valencia, so a block from us, uh, half a block from 826 Valencia. So I would have this routine. I always knew when it was coming out. I'd go get it. I'd have the best time over lunch. And the day that that box disappeared was one of the saddest days I can remember because I don't read much online. I uh, uh, And I really count on things in print and so it's uh anyway but i get it makes sense now that newspapers aren't as dominant uh that it has to be online but i i do really remember i remember reading it at madison when i would visit there i remember reading it you know in all the places i remember seeing it proliferate 
but that having your own newspaper box is just so uh, legit. And um, it, it really filled out the, the verisimilitude. Yeah. The, it, the parody was complete. No, I appreciate you saying all that. And I felt the same way. I was really saddened when we stopped doing print, especially saddened when we lost the San Francisco edition because mm. for whatever reason, The Onion was so beloved in San Francisco. Yeah, I don't know what it was about this area, but it just had this special connection with the city. I don't know what. Yeah. Um, now, you said a moment ago, I thought it was interesting, you re- referred to it as 826 Valencia when you were speaking of the general idea of the store, but it's isn't it called 826 National now? Yeah, we're in San Francisco, it's so here we're base. 826 Valencia, yeah. And then the umbrella is 826 National, and that body is a has its own office here, and they oversee all the other 826s and help in any way. Okay, well, let's back up for a second. So we were on um, Esquire, yeah, and I think you, you had just sort of sideswiped uh, a career track in pure comedy, and yeah. started McSweeney's when you were still at Esquire. Well, I'll also say, like, I would have failed miserably at Letterman or any... Because those guys, when I met real comedy writers, they're just on a so many levels above whatever I could do. And even at Might, they were always... I was, I was an editor more than I was, like, the guy that was coming up with the funniest stuff. Like, Zev was a thousand times funnier than me, and I could help edit... And when we started the McSweeney's website, I was the editor. So I would edit a humor piece every day, and I could sometimes shave off the, the extra stuff and reduce it. You know, it's always about reducing it to the fewest words possible and getting rid of the, the hokey stuff or the unnecessary exclamation part points and things like that. But I was much better as an editor for that or for any of that uh, than I was the, the originator. Yeah, no, I would put myself in that same category. There's always, I don't want to be the funniest person in the room. Yeah. I want to find the funniest people yeah, yeah. and call. So tell me what you think makes you such a good editor. Like, what is it about uh, your just your subjective opinion about humor or how it's presented that, that makes that a skill for you? Well, you always know it when you see it. If, if, if somebody makes you laugh out loud, they're one in a hundred, period. And there's there's the people that, and there's something totally anarchic about the people that can really make you laugh out loud that they might not be very functional in society you never know or they're the most functional but you just it's very hard to place and i think that what we always got at mcsweeney's was like a and we it was still this website still runs a lot of these pieces that are very witty and then there's this other part the people that can make you laugh out loud and that has to involve something really unexpected really inappropriate really uh there's just a rhythm that's a little different, and it has to be surprising in the order of words, the order of thoughts, whereas most of us adhere to a certain linearity that makes for witty, kind of interesting, oh, I see, I see a point you're making, but it, it's not necessarily funny. And, and I think sometimes it's extra words, sometimes it's trying to be too uh, literary, to, sometimes it's trying to, you know, adhere to laws of propriety, but... But when you uh, when you see somebody that kind of breaks those rules and does and can sort of bust out of it, then they're uh, you're just hoping as an editor to sort of just harness that a little bit and maybe put a comma in the right place, but otherwise stay out of their way. And I always remember having you know those writers come through at uh, on the McSweeney site and. You know, for, at this point, the people that have written for that site, the editors are now Chris Monks and John Warner, and they've been doing it for a lot, of, a lot of years. And Chris Monks works out of a his house, like in a his apartment in Boston, and uh, he just does it from home. And John Warner, you know, lives in uh, South Carolina, and he helps out. And another Illinois grad, John, and um, those guys, they've they've been, you know. They've edited, like, Tim Carvel used to publish some of his early stuff at McSweeney's. Ellie Kemper way back when. Um, Wendy Molyneux, I think, was some of her very first stuff was there. So to be able to be a, a home for those people on the uh, coming up, when I didn't realize how many people had sort of published early work on that site until John and Chris sort of put this list together at one point that was stunning 
all these people that write for Bob's Burgers and and uh, Letterman and The Daily Show and wherever else. I think some of the writers from Seth Meyers and and every so often, even now, the site will. If somebody can't play something, probably at a paying venue, they'll come to uh, the McSweeney site, which is great. So uh, it's really yeah, it's a great place to start. I always recommend people starting out just submit at least. You yeah, know. submit, and people, good people, read it, and so you might get paying work out of it. We wish we, they pay a little bit, I think, these days, but there's just no money, and and uh, I, the fact that the Onion and a few other sites, maybe two sites in the history of the internet, have made content uh sites that actually are, are profitable is uh remarkable yeah so how do you find other editors who you think are going to edit as well as you edit that's tough I, the the editors john and you know john i knew a little bit from college and uh and john used to write for the site and so and then you know, John ended up marrying a friend of mine from high school, so we would see each other around. And when I was ready to retire from the site, and we'd had a few other editors in between who were great. Um, Kevin Shea had done it for a while, and uh, you know, you just think you, the guy has to be very responsible first of all, which is a whole different skill set. Just sh yeah, showing up, being showing up, <laughs> wanting to do it, which often doesn't go hand in hand with exactly the comedy skills. John also wrote a book about how to write funny, and he was a, you know, he's a, he teaches at, he taught at Illinois and then Clemson. He's a writing teacher, and just very responsible, really calm, always supportive of young writers, wanting to find new stuff. He had similar sense of humor, and just um, he could get it done every day. And then Chris Monks had been writing for the site for a lot of years, and then when John was ready to pull back a little bit he asked Chris if he could do it so um but you do need somebody it's a unique skill set to be able to make a pretty good piece into a really good piece and I think that uh you can wreck just about anything if you're a good, not a good editor you know or an overbearing one or somebody that actually doesn't know what's funny or what isn't funny so those guys I think have uh built a really loyal um loyalty among their writers who I think really know that they know what they're doing and uh and uh that's what's it's remarkable to see that website which you know at most I think I put up one or two pieces myself when I was doing it out of my Brooklyn bedroom um but now they have this it's this vast I think there's there must be 15 20,000 pieces on that site in the archives and that's really all John and Chris and Kevin and the other people that followed and then what about the quarterlies? Is that something where you step in and edit, or do they edit, or do you have guest editors for those? Um, these days, it's Jordan Bass, who's the executive editor. I'm retired, so I... You're not involved at all? If they need me, the or chairman. if I can refer them to something, but, you know, it was 15 years, I think, I did it. No, well, 98, whatever the math is. So, <laughs> it's a long like time. And uh, my favorite thing is to hand off a uh, something to better qualified people. And so that is a wonderful feeling. Don't you think? And it. especially if it continues Yep. and Jordan's one of the best editors around. So knowing that he can take over and Andy Wynette took over the believer and, um, and a two six Valencia is beat Nazarian, who is a long time public school, uh, teacher and then a principal. She runs the center and has grown it far beyond what I thought possible and that's just because she she's uh far better at her job than I was at running 826 with so you uh, find, yeah so it t I think it takes a certain type of egoless boss slash entrepreneur to be able to hand off to people and find people who you know are better than you a lot of people are scared of that because they think they might be overshadowed or yeah. diminished but it seems like you're very comfortable and very aware of your own weaknesses, and you find people, who, oh, this person's better than me, I'll pass it on to that person, which is a rare skill. I know I'm a bad manager, so I... I uh, it doesn't seem like it, because you have many mm, enterprises, no, if I'm and they're doing all it, very well-respected, and they do good work, and... Well, if I were doing it day-to-day, -day, every day, maybe I would be a little better. I, I don't know. But because I'm always trying to write books on my own, being a part-time manager isn't right, isn't fair to anybody. 
So I always know that unless I'm there all day, I don't really have a say. You know, I should really step back and make sure that, you know, there's somebody there that's really guiding the ship every day. So, um, and it's been an incredible thing to know, you know, when you, when somebody really talented is willing to take on a, a role and then make it their own and have a, a real sense of ownership over it. Um, we have another organization called Scholar Match, which is across the street from 826 Valencia, and it's for college access. So when our kids were aging up, they were going to college, so many of our kids were first generation or AB 540, you know, so-called. You say our kids, you mean kids who went through yeah, the 826? Yeah, through 826. So gotcha. since we've known them and their families since they were six, you know, and suddenly they're 17, they don't have a college plan. Parents can't figure out the FAFSAs and all this, you know, this incredibly Byzantine system. So we built this organization, Scholar Match, that deals with, helps with funding, financing, crowdfunding for college education, and also four years of counseling. And we built it. It was hit or miss for a while. We didn't, we were trying to make it work. And then uh, I ran into a woman named Diana Adamson who lives a few blocks away. And um, she, you know, took it from this amorphous, struggling organization and has professionalized it and another guy noel ramirez and their whole staff just made it into really i think like absolute leader in this f sphere to the point where i'm in awe of what they've achieved they've got 145 kids in college now that will all graduate they've got a 96 percent retention rate in a very hard place to make sure that kids first generation kids um, low-income kids get through four years of college. That's so super great. It's it's so beyond what you, I can even communicate. It's like a it's a problem that people have been trying to solve for decades, and these guys have a, a system and a philosophy and the staff and the, and 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 they care so much that they make it work for for these kids that uh, uh, deserve the help. And um, so that's another situation where you get lucky and you. You bring in the right people, and then you just sort of support them any way you can. And these are nonprofits, right? This and A26. They're all nonprofits. All nonprofits. So, um, do you get funding? Do you have people writing grants? Yeah. So okay. grants, so individual fund, uh, individual donations, fundraisers. We had this fundraiser at A26 LA last week that some of the people that you know, Bob Odenkirk, did it. BJ Novak has been a huge supporter down there. That's great. So he brought in. Uh, and Mindy Kaling was up here doing a fundraiser about a month ago. So they, you know, obviously BJ and Mindy go way back. And uh, so when you get people like that that are willing to make some phone calls, BJ says, oh, you know, he has that list app. And uh, so he, it was a night of people reading lists. So it was him and Al Madrigal and, uh, and Bob and Catherine Keener, Kristen Shaw, all these people. That's great. And people pay money to come and, you know, raised four hundred and fifty thousand dollars or wow. something, which is kind of a miraculous amount of money for one night of comedy. So, <laughs> you know, we um, been really lucky to uh, again when you sort of get involved with these people that, you know, BJ started out as a tutor, so he would just come into the center wow. in uh, Venice, and uh, and he would just tutor it. He'd come in after after school. Slip in, slip out, no fuss, nothing. And then eventually people are like, isn't that guy from the office? He's, he's over there working with, you know, our third graders. And, and, uh, and so I think finally somebody said, aren't you, know, aren't you B.J. Novak? And, uh, and from there it sort of progressed and he became, uh, you know, more prominent. And we, he came out and was, you know, did some fundraisers for us and now, you know, really has uh, become kind of a phenomenal uh, supporter. And the first guy at, in L.A. was Judd Apatow. He was the guy that... You ever hear about this fundraiser he did? No. So you guys would appreciate this. He uh, So the, the center in L.A. was broke. It started with $11,000, and it was on the second floor of a former jail. It was called the Spark Center in Venice. So all we had, all we could afford was to rent the second floor for nothing every month. And we couldn't raise money down there. I don't know what was going on. But so Judd got word of the center and he thought, okay, well, let's do a fundraiser. It's going to be a fundraiser, but a parody of a fundraiser. So he said, we're going to honor Seth Rogen. This is before Seth 
had done uh, Knocked Up. So he was just known by Freaks and Geeks. Sure. We're going to honor Seth Rogen for the charitable work he's considering doing in the future. <laughs> so it was all about Seth's possible <laughs> interest in future philanthropy. So this is starting to ring a bell. I yeah, think I so we had all this. these people lined up, Ben Stiller, Will Ferrell, everybody honoring Seth. Hey, Seth, I'm so proud of you that you're considering possibly in the future doing something good. And and then Judd curated the whole thing. So we barely did anything. We just showed up. But Judd said, okay, it's going to be $1,000 a plate, which is 100 times what we'd ever charge anybody. And, and it's $1,000 a plate when you walk in instead of re regular chicken rubber chicken dinner he gives you a box of kfc these are like the biggest executives in la paying a thousand dollars and they get a box of kentucky fried chicken on the table there's nothing to drink except for red bull and vodka that's all you're allowed to have and then the the, the centerpieces were three week old flowers from the golden globes that somehow he had gotten a hold of and then the decor around it was all from Rocky Five, I think, like great. that had premiered, you know, six months before. So it was all secondhand stuff, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Red Bull Vodka, and then this procession of people um, honoring Seth, who was like 20 years old or something, who had no idea what was going on. Like he got up and gave this hilarious speech about like he has no idea what anything, what any of this was. But that raised, I think, half a million dollars. So it built a second center in Echo Park from scratch. Like that was all because of that. Mm -hmm. And then the name of 826 LA got out and they've been doing, they've expanded at least 20 fold since then. So mm -hmm. they had two staffers that day and now they have, I think, 32 and uh, serve about 16,000 kids a year. And that was all like, I love that because it's a parody of a fundraiser, but it, but it has real effect. And um, so very often we're mixing something surreal like that with actual philanthropy and that's what all the storefronts are too and i think the kids appreciate it too because creative writing doesn't have to be too serious it should be strange it should be you know uh you know um anarchic yeah the superhero supply store was a magical thing for me to discover in brooklyn i don't know when you what, what year did you start that that would have been 2004. Okay. So, so that was yeah. Scott Seeley, a guy who knew how to build things. So he actually built that from, from scratch himself. Yeah. So I was living there then, and I, I didn't know what 826 was. Hadn't heard of 826 Valencia and just happened upon the superhero store, which is... Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, that must have been weird. No, it's like a great type of street art. It's like yeah. almost being punked uh, as yeah. part of a gag. Yeah. Um, a beautiful thing. And, and did you see the secret door that le leads to the I've seen the secret yeah. door. A friend of mine, Peter Hilleran, who co-wrote my George W. Bush autobiography, worked there. He volunteered there <laughs> oh, he for did. a long okay. time. So, yeah, I know it well. And now there's one in Chicago that I still haven't seen. Yeah, they I've just moved the, last year. So they were they were in Wicker, Wicker Park. Park on Milwaukee Ave. Uh, and they just moved across the street. And... Um, and they built a really beautiful new spot. And that's time travel supplies? There? No, that's... Um, Secret Agent. Secret Agent. Supplies. So Chris Ware did the original facade. Right. And it was supposed to be the boring store. And it was like, if you're a Secret Agent, you can't be seen going into the Secret Agent right. store. So it said the boring store. And all the text was, nothing to see here. Keep moving. And we would put like cardboard boxes in the window just to say there's nothing here it's right, the, right the new spot that chicago has is a little bit more transparent but um yeah you know and then uh uh there's a new center in the tenderloin that we built a new uh a new place that opened a couple of weeks ago that uh is sort of a spin-off of the pirate store and um but you know there are similar centers now all around the world that they they come here they borrow the idea and then they take it back to Dublin or which you don't mind. Oh, we love it. I mean, any any iterations of it, any way you want to apply the model or interpret it, is good with us. So I think there's now 22 around the world that go to Sydney. You'll see the Sydney Story Factory, which has the look of the inside of a whale. So it's all ribbed like you're. Neat. And you're not affiliated. No, we. I think our website links to them, and otherwise there's little gatherings once a year. Last one was in London where all the centers come and share ideas. But, you know, 
they I, I don't think they necessarily want us to try to manage them and we don't want to manage them and um but is it an official franchise or just totally unrelated we didn't know what to call I don't know, i'm it. confused but it's unrelated well, but here's the thing like you say you're not a good manager but you're such a good manager that you don't even realize how good you're managing because what you're doing is you're giving people some element of autonomy over what they're doing you give them a very long leash and let them succeed so they feel a sense of ownership and that's the best way to get the best out of anybody and so you you step back and people do that and even further people are inspired by what's happening so even people who aren't under your umbrella are off doing <laughs> doing it which is like you know there are people who work 80 hour weeks trying to spread their franchised sandwich shop or whatever yeah and you're doing it without even trying to, well, to it, build it, and grow it this has to idea. be in the nonprofit sphere too because you're not trying to trademark anything or make money off of it so you know what we i don't know if you saw a few years ago we published uh beck did a book of uh uh sheet music i did not see that so it was just sheet music from for 20 songs that he never recorded so he hadn't recorded them. There was no model of how it sh should sound outside of the sheet music. And he just let fans make their own versions. So you go to YouTube, there's like a thousand versions of every song. And I thought that was such an amazing kind of act of generosity, first of all. But And then later we had a fundraiser with bands playing versions. We had something here at the uh, Opera House. and uh, But... I love those things where you sort of just start it and then let it go and see where it goes and you don't have to control it and the you just you have to be open to the ups and downs and iterations of it but um but how come so many of those things that you've started to have sort of started to spiral and grow and so few at least that I know of have fizzled out well I mean McSweeney's is has always been in dire financial circumstances from day one. So I, we, I, I, I can't say it's grown. It has survived as literary magazines. But it's grown in all they reputation can do. and respect. Certainly, maybe I um. You know, I don't know. I think that a lot of it is. Uh, it really is knowing when to give it to the next person. You know, like I'm an old man now. I needed to like hand it off a long time ago. And the first guy I handed off McSweeney's to was Eli Horowitz, who was our first hire. It was 2001, 2002. And he was so talented and young and much, he had, you know, energy. He'd read more than I had. He was better editor than I was. And I sort of gave him control of everything because I knew he was doing a lot better job than I could. So I love the handing off period when you say... Well, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, you got to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. And, for example, uh, our art director at McSweeney's now is a guy named Dan McKinley, and he has uh, another designer, Sunra Thompson. And they're much better designers than I am, so I know, you know, when you face, like you said, you don't want to be the most talented guy in the room. When you're faced with somebody who's clearly better at something, being able to recognize that and get out of the way and then be available if they need help or whatever, that's fine. But um, the books that have happened through McSweeney's since Dan and Sunra took over, because Eli and I used to design everything, are so much better. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, we, we did plenty of good books way back then, but we always made mistakes because we were self-taught. And these two guys are actual designers. So, um, you know, having respect for real professionalism and real expertise um, everything we did was always DIY, but every so often you see somebody that has actual training, <laughs> and uh, and it's the difference is usually pretty clear. But um, yeah, you know, as you get older, I think the more the same way you appreciate things that your kids do that you don't have any control over, and you can just sit back and enjoy what they do and who they become. I like that. The same thing with young staffers. All of our staffers were interns first, for the most part. And um, seeing what they do and become, and they go off to write books, and they go off to run other companies and other magazines, and uh, and also seeing all the A26s grow without any, you know, anything more than support. Um, that's all. Uh, it's just too good to be true. You yeah, know, it must be incredibly gratifying. 
Yeah. So we skipped over one part of your career. We went right to 826, but you you drifted away from a lot of the comedy enterprises and uh, started becoming a writer of serious fiction. Yeah. And Some that's of kind of when you you obviously struck it very big with um, the staggering work. That must have been a little awkward for you because you had always been sort of this guy on the outside doing a lot of, like you were saying, kind of mixing parody and real and like doing joke interviews. Um, now suddenly you're thrust into kind of the mainstream of how they do things. And I'm guessing that was a little awkward for you. Sure. I was a satirist. So all we did was make fun of these things and in interviews. And Were you just the bane of your publisher's publicist? No, no. I mean... You know, it was uh, it was a learning process for sure because uh, really it was. Uh, I mean, I the number of parodies of interviews and parodies of, I mean, it was uh, it was again it was a weird hall of mirrors there, and I sort of uh, the the satirist in me and the might magazine editor in me was like, it it was a very strange pivot. Uh, suddenly when, you know, I'd written a book that had jokes in it, but it was a serious book. And um, so it got confusing for everybody, including including me for a while. But I think that that's the case with, I mean, I was 29 or something. I was impossibly young, I think. And, uh, you know, you learn from it. But, um, and then from then, you know, I think I've always tried to balance um, writing books that I, take very seriously but i always enjoy doing ridiculous stuff still like i mean uh, even that even uh uh heartbreaking what do you what do you call that book uh, a heartbreaking work of staggering genius for shorthand <laughs> what's, what's your term for the book because I, uh, I usually just say the first book the first know? book we'll yeah. call it the first book yeah um that book is very funny and yes there's serious stuff in it and yes what, it's um, based on what, your true what, what life you, story what do you call but that book a, you, a you can see work. just how um, what, this what you, is a satirical mind and there's a lot of what do you satirical call that book, uh, subtext that's coming through in that book and all your books uh, have this comedic intelligence what, what, what behind book, what's uh, being written about even if it's genius. dark or seemingly serious or whatever and in, in a lot of ways, that's what a lot of what satirists you, or comedy writers, especially, book, maybe uh, less so satirists, want. Mm -hmm. They want to be taken I, seriously. I mm -hmm. And you kind of manage to p put one foot in the serious world, but still be a comedy guy. Is that what your intent? Or do you intend to just write serious books and they just sort of end up... No, I mean, fun? some of the books don't have a joke anywhere near them. But, um, but there's this wry sort of intelligence behind them that makes them funny even when they're being serious you know what i'm, you know what I'm yeah, talking about yeah yeah i think it's like that i think it seeps in i you know the the book that i just wrote um or that comes out in a, about a month uh which they sent me and i have not had time to finish yeah it seems like a much lighter touch yeah that one is back i mean that one that was actively um going uh, allowing it to be funny all the way through and, and making an effort in that direction. And um, and that's Heroes of the Frontier. Yeah. What can you tell us about that book in general? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's about a, a mom who's now a single mom, divorced to a very incompetent uh, human, um, uh, and her two young kids, and they are going through Alaska in a, in a rented ancient RV. And um, so... I, uh, it was just like a vessel for a lot of thoughts I had about parenthood and, and, uh, and also, um, I think I, you know, a lot of it is, uh, uh, well, I don't know. It, it, to me, it was, I wanted to get back to something that was really fun to write too, because some of the stuff I work on is very heavy and I'm, you know, right now in the middle of some projects that are very, very, very depressing. And, and, um, and this is jaunty and this is jaunty. Yeah. Thank it you. really is. And, uh, you know, it's, there's serious themes in there. And I think a lot of it is about the inherent, you know, uh, barbaric nature of, uh, of uh, who we are as Americans. I think that we are still a barbaric frontier race that, uh, 
uh, has an exceptionally high tolerance for violence and, uh, and war making. And, you know, this is some of the subtext, but yeah, no, that's some great satire. That's like Jonathan Swift level stuff. Mm. Just like you, you may find the average satirist finding little foibles yeah. in humans, but it's the great satirist who can say, you know what, we're, we are just a fucked up <laughs> species of animal because yeah. look, at, look at what we're capable of. Well, yeah, I think that, you know, we don't, you know, when you see how the rest of the world sees us, um, they, and we, we carry it very lightly, the fact that we can have two concurrent wars going on with countless hundreds of thousands of people dead in the process. And we're just happy as clams, uh, you know, moving along and, uh, and it doesn't really weigh on us. In as long as way. the Starbucks is open. It's very odd. And I don't think, and, and, and no one else can quite comprehend it. But don't you think it's all humans? Or do you no. think it's just Americans? No, I, I don't think. I think we're very unique because um, I think a lot of other people, a lot of other nations carry it very heavily. You know, they're recent. And it, so much of it is because our adventures are abroad and our wars are very far away. And um, so it can be very uh, remote. We can sort of have it as this low level hum in the background like oh there's not i mean so there's a passage in there where uh josie the protagonist is debating with a grenado vet whether or not we're still in afghanistan and neither one of them can remember are we still there who's going and i think if you pulled 100 people on the street no one you'd have 50 50 whether we were still there who's there what are we doing there and that's very unique, I think. I don't think that, I think the people in Denmark would know exactly how many soldiers they have where and what they're doing. But for us, I think it's just been such a long history of, of adventures and, and outposts of various kinds uh, that we sort of have a pretty, pretty high tolerance for it. Even if, uh, even if we don't want war, I think that as they continue, there isn't the outrage dissipates and we sort of come to accept you know and i think and it, it it's related to the, to the amount of violence that we accept from uh, every day you know whether it's the you know gun violence and shootings and police shootings and mass shooting all of these things are an extraordinarily high rate of uh of violence for a civilized country and and yet we're sort of okay with it. We've come to accept it. And, it's um, part, part of who we are. If you look at our But history. that's what we say. It's part of who we are. No, it is. Because we are frontier people, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and then you look at, other, you look at Canada and Australia, which are very similar in terms of the makeup and proximity to frontier, and they're much more peaceful societies. And I think we have a lot of evolving to do still to be our best selves. Yeah, well, they had the um, genocide of native peoples, um, like we had, yeah. they didn't have slavery as long as we had. Yeah. So we, I do feel like we're more accustomed to having violence, an integral part of our day to day lives. Yeah. I, but yeah. I, and, and so, you know, I've been, anyway, it's some of the stuff I'm working on on the long yeah, no, term. It's, it's a, but it's yeah, a, I wanted that to be threaded throughout and, you know, you were mentioning Swift, and I, you know, I love going back to him, going back to Candide, going back to, this is also sort of a book where I was, you know, my favorite writer, Saul Bellow, and going back to that den density of prose, you know, where it's interior in one minute, but trying to be very descriptive of the world around, and and, and, and very cognizant of that moment in history, and, and how it does or doesn't weigh on the your characters and um but uh so it was i've been working on this one on and off for about five years and so to me this is the prose is sort of uh uh as uh as as dense and honed as uh as i can as i can do at this point so i i uh and there's and there's you know it's, it's I can still go back to it, which is very rare. I can pick up an average page and, and like a, a line or two, which is really hard to do with your own work. Very few, very little of your own work is going to do that. Spielberg has a great story of how 
he's only made one movie that he can watch again and enjoy, and it's what is Raiders it? of the Lost Ark. Oh, really? Like he made it quickly enough that it didn't scar him emotionally. <laughs> the experience, like making movies, does most people, and he can find it enjoyable. Wow. And I can see how that can be the case with Heroes of the Frontier. It doesn't feel dense, like it doesn't feel like, you know, Huxley or one of these like really dense books. It, Candide is a great reference because it feels like it. Uh, it just has this sort of happy quality. Yeah, Candide is light as air. I mean, right. you could uh, read that by the pool and uh, you know have uh, the margarita and and have a great great old time, even though it's working on a lot of different levels. But it's, yeah, and it makes as as is your book because it it makes such great contrast between that and the subtext that you're trying to get across. Yeah, for right. um, some great satire. So good work on that. Let's talk about sort of what you feel like is the state of comedy today you you had such a seminal role in establishing a lot of these kind of early comedic institutions that millennials grew up with where do you see things now like what would you be doing now if you were starting out in comedy would you start another website or a blog or would you take that letterman job uh maybe i think that i think the stuff that's going on late night is really good i like the skits i'm a fan i i uh they're back to the Letterman style. Yeah, stuff. There's, it's really. I think because there's so many shows that there's not too many much pressure on any one. So I feel like the writers are doing some really bizarre stuff, which is always my favorite. Um, and um, but you know, I just got done rewatching season one of Key and Peele, and Keegan Michael Key was one of the guys at that benefit the other okay. night. So just got to say hi to him. But I thought that was on. The level that, uh, on a on a level that was so extraordinary. There are skits there that will stand for. <laughs> I was about to be a little hyperbolic there, for stand for a hundred years. And I'm, uh, but you know, it's I great thought stuff. Great I stuff. thought that that was like the most revelatory breakthrough kind of show in a long time. And um, and I really mourned when I heard that they. Were, we're going to quit already uh, and move on to other stuff. But movies, right? Movies. And, um, but, um, and I haven't seen Keanu yet. But I think it's a, you know, the more sort of uh, egalitarian the playing field becomes, the more networks there are that will give shows to people without, you know, uh, you know, it was Dan Harmon that did an, an interview with The Believer. And he was talking about how in movies there's like 100 executives for every movie. And in TV, it's like 100 shows for every one executive. Some, I'm probably butchering that quote, but it feels like there is a lot less oversight and a lot less hand-holding or iron fisting. <laughs> that sounded terrible. <laughs> oh, my God, I've never said that, but all right. Um, but it's, there are so many channels. And yeah. So many talented people now can get a show. In well, the old days, they couldn't. You, not everybody. Nobody got a show. I thought you, were you know, Adult Swim changed things a lot, and then Tim and Eric were to me that was another revelation. That yeah, that was. I have seen everything they've done a hundred times, and um, so when that kind of thing is possible, which never would have been possible when production costs were much higher, and you know, I've been to that Tim and Eric studio, which is the size of this room. It really? is. It's a bedroom, basically. It's tiny. And there, actually, the guy that was the producer of Tim and Eric was a guy named Dave Kneebone that started as an intern at McSweeney's. Wow. He, has, he had a documentary film degree from Stanford. And then he, he was uh, suddenly our business manager. He didn't know how to do business managing. But, you know, he moved up, and then he moved to L.A., and he became their producer and still does every other show down there. So Kneebone is doing really well. Yeah, see, so you're, like, I mean, you were so upstream of a lot of these things that you helped a lot of these people who ended up doing a lot of these great things. I, I mean, didn't Bob do anything Kirk. for Kneebone at all, but... You gave him an opportunity. I didn't, you know, Kneebone, uh, I didn't know he could produce a TV show, and there he, there he goes. We're just, I'm happy to know that guy, because he uh, helped make uh, that show and a lot of other shows. And But yeah, Tim and Eric and... Um, seismic show. Seismic, and... Um, but, you know, very recently I've lost a little... I don't have... Uh, I can't keep up the same way. We used to do a thing called Wolfen. It was like a DVD quarterly of short films. And that was Brent Hoff, the editor, lived like three blocks away on 11th here. And um, and when that went away, he was kind of a little bit of a lifeline to me. 
to knowing what was going on uh, with well, there's, yeah there's too many shows there's too many websites it's impossible right but you mean in a good way too many because I well, think it's, it's a I good think it's thing. A, it can be good it can be but some people are uh, intimidated by that it's like yeah how can I splash through in this flooded market but on the other hand yes there's more of an opportunity for somebody to actually make something happen because there are so many outlets well and look at you know so I was looking at your podcast that I the editor of Reductress. Uh, Right, Beth Newell. Yeah. So I got turned on to that yesterday through your podcast. <laughs> and I went to that site, which is hysterical. They do great like, work. Oh, yeah. my God. And I think the, the technology is such that you only need a few people to get a, start, a, yeah, a website. Yeah, she, she and her, uh, her partner. Yeah. That was it. And it's a necessary voice, though. I don't know if they're making a living. I don't know what. but um, Yeah, they're doing all right. Yeah. But if you keep your operation lean, you can make a go of it. You can ideally pay your rent. You can uh, have a influence in the public conversation. And you just have to be content with sometimes a certain uh, ceiling, I guess. So at McSweeney's, our, you know, we still only print five, ten thousand 10,000 copies of a given issue. We came to grips with that. It was never going to be a giant thing. And we're content there. And the McSweeney's website gets a lot more views, apparently. And but there's not a whole lot of revenue that comes out of, out of it. But you come, you know, you you come to grips with that. And I love the. I always love the low uh, uh, um, uh, hurdle to access. What's the other way to say that anyway? Um, but barrier to entry. It's pretty good. The yeah, economic that's term. What the term they use. I always feel like culturally you have to have a very low barrier to entry and digital media makes that possible for totally. film, for TV, for websites and everything. Desktop publishing made my magazine possible, made McSweeney's possible. The fact that I could do it on one Mac at home. And the more you can do that in a podcast where we can just sit in a room and do this and anyone has access to it, then good things come from that. I think the more you silo things with a lot of power, concentrate, a lot of gatekeepers, you end up with a lot of watered down, terrible stuff. And the more it's like there's fewer executives, fewer people saying no or chiseling away all the good stuff, then you're going to end up with some really singular, memorable things. And uh, so I think it's always a, I always like more. I think more is always going to be better. Um, it's not to say that you can't sometimes concentrate a lot of talent in one spot and have a lot of curation and make great, great things. But if you look at Monty Python, which I always, to me, is always the benchmark for anything, there was nobody minding the store there. It was just those guys. Like nobody was saying a word. The executives didn't exist. There was nobody telling them what to do. They Even just, those guys didn't have a leader. It was group, yeah. you know. Uh, you cannot they find a leader among idea. them. They will not claim like, oh, it was Cleese who was doing this. They really, uh, they went off and did their groups and and they just tooth and nail, you maybe know, fought over stitched stuff. together by Gilliam in the end. But it was a beautiful mess, you know. Yeah. I think in terms of their management. And if you look at those now, just like if you look at their early SNLs, they're really sloppy sometimes. And you you always think like, oh, it must have been this perfect you know, mosaic, and you think, oh, no, actually, it was pretty raw, a lot of it, and some of it, and the skits that we remember stand apart from an episode that might have a lot of hit-or-miss stuff, but you need to allow that, you know, just like with any uh, law of averages, just like uh, when you look at Key and Peele, when you see the skits separated, there's some of the greatest things you've ever seen, and then in a given episode, there might be some ones that won't necessarily hold up as much but i love uh you know the uh the current state of things i and you know i just can't i can't personally keep up with it as much these days somebody has to put something right in front of me before i because i didn't i don't think i knew key and peel until zadie smith wrote her piece in the new yorker about it. i was like oh it was, it was key and peel and i'm usually about i'm usually pretty late but then i catch up and is that because your just head is buried into your writing and you lose yourself? Yeah. I can imagine that's what it's like writing novels. Yeah, I mean, if I'm writing, that's eight hours a day that I don't really do anything else. So um, You write for eight hours a day? That's a lot. I have to be in my writing position for eight hours a day. So okay. 
I have to be, I have to have nine to five without any interruption. And if I can do that, then I might actually produce something that day. Um, much, yeah. How much actual writing happens in that eight hours? Generally? An hour, you an know, hour? I mean, I don't know. It depends, but that's usually the average, that's the ratio I, I usually say, but I don't know. Um, but if I'm interrupted, <clears throat> like on a day like that, I, I, I don't, I can't go. If somebody wants to have lunch, I don't go to lunch. I can't yeah, you'll never get your momentum back, right? Yeah. So I'm pretty, I, I have to stay pretty isolated on those days. And, uh, so it makes it a little harder. And then, you know, my kids are young and I was, uh, you know, I, this last spring it was 14 to 20 hours a week was just coaching baseball and softball, you know, two practices each, two games each, you know, other stuff. So the, the time that you have to sort of catch up with a new website it starts shrinking uh yeah, especially with point. the volume that there is yeah especially but you know it doesn't mean i don't love i mean i'll binge on something like i binged on reductress yesterday and i think i got you know i was there for an hour and a half just like quoting stuff to my wife and you know i wanted to show it to everybody i i knew because it was exactly what we uh you know the kind of stuff that we would have been up to in our 20s uh, or were up to with Might and other things. So, Well, be sure to check out uh, Liar Town USA. I saw that. You've seen it. I saw okay. the same thing I because of your podcast. <laughs> oh, okay. And I just saw the first few pages that were all these like uh, paperback books that they had sort of repurposed with these uh, yeah. pornographic well, titles. Well, you say they, but it's he. It's just a guy. It's just one guy. <laughs> it's just a That's guy. That's the same thing. I mean, this is actually why I can't have a smartphone because I would be on there for a day. I don't have any way to turn it off. Like, I'll just, I'll binge. And, and you're not on social media either, are you? No, I mean, I don't I don't have internet access. So You're I, one of two people I know who, well, two um, people in the business who I know who just don't do it. Anyway, yeah. The, uh, any reason for that uh, besides just it's the not same having thing. the distraction? If I had cable TV, I'd watch cable TV all day. If I had uh, if I had internet access, I'd be on ESPN or YouTube all day. So I uh, to get work done, so I can pay the bills. I actually have to uh, uh, I have to turn off or not have access to distractions because. I grew up in a house with the TV on 18 hours a day. Like it was always on and it gets in your, it rewires your brain a little bit. So if I'm around a TV and then blazing saddles comes on like that, you're sucked. I right can't, in, yeah. I don't have the willpower to not watch it. I really don't. So I'll watch it and I'll say, well, who's going to stop me? Right. I work, work at home. And, uh, so, um, you know, the solution for me was to not have these things coming in. So if I wanted to watch it, I'd have to make an active thing. I got to go to the library, check out Blazing Saddles, come back, put it in. And that's a different thing than just sort of it passively coming through. So that's the same way with, with it, you know, the web in general. It's, there's too many good distractions. And if I had somebody like you turning me on to like these new websites every other day like that, forget it. I would, I would it'd be a rabbit hole I would never <laughs> emerge from. So I always respect people that have much better willpower um or be can work at home and manage these things manage the balance between working on your own stuff and pass you know here and there checking out thing you know what would i if i had access to the onion all day every day like that's uh that would be catastrophic um because i love the deep going way way back to and oh yeah that reminds me of that headline from way back when um so yeah i I have to limit my access to things. If I, especially if I want to read, you got to change your brain. You know, like I like to read every day for a couple hours, and it doesn't actually work well with the way the speed of access and with uh, digital media. It's much faster. I feel like it rewires your brain that day, because if you start and you wake up and you're on the phone. There's no way you can switch back to like reading prose. Yeah, you're right. The pace is just your brain is already off. like sped up to the point where it's it can't concentrate. So I feel like we're still at a evolutionary midpoint trying to figure out well how do you balance these two things and maybe there are people that are better at it, but uh, I find it's like one or the other 
um, on a daily basis, at least, you know? Well, it seems to have helped you to know that. Like you said, it's a lot of it is about just knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I speak at colleges about the circle, right? This book I've wrote about technology. And, yeah. and I always tell them the same thing that Jaron Lanier, who's a, you know, digital theorist across the Bay here, says like, when you're young, you gotta, it's now, it's time to experiment on yourself. Cause so many young people and my former high school students would always struggle with digital, their digital lives. They can't balance the two and they're actually not happy about it. They're like, you know, we think that they've got it figured out and that they love social media so much. And every last student I ever talked to was struggling. How do you balance the two? How do you turn it off? How do you, you know, lower the expectations for constant connectivity with your friends? And um, so, and Jaron was saying, and I always repeat, you know, you got to experiment with yourself. Like if it's, are you a one hour a day person? Are you a person that can't have a, uh, a, a, uh, you know, uh, an iPhone, but you need a flip phone, you know, to like limit it, whatever it is, you've got to know yourself. Um, and, and I think that if, if kids know, like they can choose and they can curate their lives in a way and, and they don't have to have the same tools as everybody else or the same constant access, then I feel like we're back to, you know, people being individuals and not necessarily like, to participate in society, it means participating at this level of constant contact that is somehow the norm. Um, I think that it's not necessarily the way for everyone. The way that per people participate with phones is the same way as if we were to have said back in our day, like growing up, the TV has to be on. Well, you got to have it on. <laughs> because you got to keep up with what's going on on TV. Be missing some yeah. people would think that was madness, you know, because everyone knew it was bad for you and melted your brain to have it on eighteen hours a day. But this is where we're at, I think, with with digital media now. It's like, well, how do you keep up with things? You have to have it on. But it is a form of TV. I mean, it's totally. still a, mostly a distraction from the work you want to do. So, um, or the, you know, enjoying. Uh, the actual world and people. So uh, it's, uh, but I think everyone can find that equilibrium as long as you allow yourself to search for it. Well, that's good advice. So let's turn off this podcast. Right now. <laughs> it's been great talking with yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, go to howtowritefunny.com for more.